So why was the newly elected president of the United States going after ABC's Martha Raddatz? We talked about the Cincinnati rally earlier in the show. Here's Donald Trump. Uh, How about when a major anchor who hosted a debate started crying when she realized that we won? How about that? Tears. No, tell me this isn't true. Well, here's the context, and we'll show it to you. It was late on election night, and Martha Raddatz, ABC correspondent and anchor, who spent a lot of time in war zones with the military, was quoting Tim Kaine as saying that his own son uh, was serving in the military, and he, Kaine, uh, wouldn't trust Donald Trump as commander in chief. And then she added this, so let's play it for the viewers. That's a pretty extraordinary thing to say uh, if you have a son in the Marine Corps and that you don't trust the commander in chief. The, the people in the military defend the Constitution. We're back with the panel. Aaron McPike, uh, what do you make of Donald Trump seizing on that moment and, and making it that, Donald, uh, that Martha well, Raddatz was crying about his election? First of all, she, she wasn't crying, and there were no tears, as he said. And Matthew Dowd, who was on set right next to her, went to Twitter and said, I was sitting right next to her, and she did not cry. Yeah. ABC came back and said she had been on air for seven hours, and so her voice may have cracked, and I think that's as far as you can go with that one. Well, Raditz herself says it's fiction, and she didn't even choke up. She kind of looked choked up to me, but everyone can make their own choice. Your thoughts, uh, Sarah? Well, I think the real problem is you pair that with the debate performance where she decided to debate Donald Trump herself instead of letting Hillary Clinton debate her. That's what created the foundation for this argument that she cried. I think she sounded like she was choked up. I think that's though, a little bit of an overstatement, but you're saying fair, she was tough. You think, think, in your opinion, she was tougher on Clinton than on Trump? Oh, well, and she debated Trump, but more to that, uh, I don't know of a single reporter who, who was rooting for Donald Trump in this, and there were several who were rooting for Hillary Clinton. That's the problem that this gets to a larger narrative. Journalists like CNN's Christian Amnapur ramping up rhetoric, telling Americans she could be thrown in jail for reporting the truth about the real Donald Trump. Never in a million years could I have imagined myself on this stage in New York really appealing for the safety and the freedom of the American press. And I base that on, obviously, Donald Trump's rhetoric against the press, calling us dishonest, despicable, and all sorts of other epithets that were hurled around. I have covered enough of my colleagues who have ended up as I put it, in cages in kangaroo courts in places like Cairo or in Moscow uh, on trial for being uh, incitors or sympathizers or associates or out and out flat out terrorists. So I feel I have to stand up for my own tribe uh, in the United States. Yeah, I think she's got the whole thing in perfect proportion. Joining us right now to discuss is Washington Times Deputy Opinion Editor Kelly Rydell. <laughs> Kelly, what's she talking about? Oh, my goodness. If this isn't hyperbole, uh, just ramping up rhetoric that is just undeserved and underwhelming. What she really should do, which Christine Amapour really should be doing, is evaluating why, why Americans' trust in journalism is at an all-time low. According to Gallup, 7 in 10 Americans mistrust the media. Now, this is in comparison to after Watergate um, in the 70s, where 72 percent of Americans trusted the media. So she really needs to have some self-reflection on why Americans mistrust trust the media and let me just tell you why it's statements like she just made in that previous clip it's statements she's so out of she has said she has said um, on Twitter and in repeated interviews that she does that she that the that neutrality doesn't matter to her only truthfulness matters to her well but, her truth is different than a lot of other people's truth is and you know some of the rallies he'll point to mm -hmm. these media goes look at the dishonest media over there and they will boo I hardly yeah. equate that to putting journalists in cages <laughs> and charging kangaroo courts and charges terror it was absolutely unbelievable. Now, the, where she gave her speech a couple weeks ago was at the Committee to Protect Journalists. And this is about international journalists going into the war zone, putting their lives on the line to, repeat, to um, report the truth. Now, this is very admirable. Since 2001, there was 37 journalists killed overseas. Uh, last year, that number more, almost doubled. So this is a real concern um, overseas in war zones. That is nothing like, you know, reporting from the U.S. and being put in maybe a press cage at a Donald Trump rally. 
rallies. Remember what Hillary Clinton did in New Hampshire? She had the press on a rope. Was that abuse? I don't know. Also, uh, <laughs> if you add to that, uh, there are some things going on with journalists uh, in the past where they're maybe not treating Donald Trump fairly and smugly. Oh, yeah. And they did, yeah. if you saw some of them in tears when he won, you know he's going into some headwinds. And Donald Trump is the type of person that wants to be the aggressor in that situation. Yeah, I mean, well, when you have Christiana Amanpour, remember when Hillary Clinton passed out at the 9-11? Yes. Um, um, well, she basically went on CNN the next day and said that this, and blamed it on sexism, the reporting on that, and said that this is just an example of an overqualified woman trying 100 times harder than an underqualified man. Now, that sums up exactly how she felt about this presidential race. So right. she was probably crying the night that Donald Trump won the election. Now, we know why uh, we booked you, Kelly. Uh, you're fired up on this. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Thank you. Kelly right Elm. Issue one, as John McLaughlin used to say, Trump taunts the press again. It was a feeling of deja vu. There he was at a rally, having a great time, playing off the crowd in Ohio. And then it's like those dishonest people in the press and the president-elect reveling in recounting uh, the election and how he says it was won in a landslide. Okay. We didn't have the press. The press was brutal criticizing, though not by name, ABC anchor Martha Raddatz, and he seemed to revel in how just about everyone in the mainstream media, and this is true, wrote him off, didn't give him a chance of winning this election. It's even true the morning of election day. They go on for weeks. Texas is in play. You turn on the television. Donald Trump has won Texas. You know, I understand uh, certainly why uh, Trump would want to claim a little bit of vindication, but it did make me think after he made some gestures toward the press, going to meet with the New York Times, having the network executives in. Is this how it's going to be uh, when he uh, moves into the White House? Is he going to be going after what he calls the dishonest and corrupt press regularly? He doesn't have to win the election anymore. He has to sell his policies. Uh, it might be nice if there would be a little bit more of a cooperative uh, a, a relationship. It's always an adversarial relationship. I don't care who is president or which party. Uh, so uh, maybe a sign of things to come, or maybe he was just letting off steam and having a good time. Issue two, Trump's tweets. The New York Times is all exercised about this. If Trump tweets it, says the headline, is it always news? A quandary for the news media. Goes on to say in this article that um, Trump's Twitter account, a bully pulpit, propaganda weapon, and attention magnet all rolled into one. That's true has quickly emerged as a fresh journalistic challenge and source of lively debate. I don't really see much of a debate here. The idea is, well, Donald Trump just fires off these 140 character messages, and it might be about something that we're not even focused on, like flag burning. People burn the flag should go to jail or lose their citizenship. And then, because we have no free will, we spend a whole day on cable news and elsewhere debating what Trump wants us to talk about. And maybe we should just ignore his tweets. That's right. We should just say, you know what? He's only the president-elect of the United States. Why should we devote any attention to dealing with the issues he wants to bring up? I understand, by the way, is a serious issue in the one tweet where Trump, without any evidence, uh, said that millions of people had voted illegally. I mean, that's something the press ought to jump on. Uh, other tweets, yeah, I mean, it's true. We shouldn't go nuclear over every time he sends out a message. Um, at the same time, uh, I guess it was after that Trump sent out a tweet saying uh, he was going to step completely out of his business and having legal papers drawn up and to turn it over to his kids. Not that much detail. That was on every website, every newspaper, every television network in America. So now imagine if it wasn't Twitter, if it was, oh, I don't know, um, Trump walking to the helicopter and saying a few words, uh, Trump putting out a short press release. Uh, Trump uh, giving a short radio interview. We wouldn't sit around and say, well, you know, it's kind of short. He didn't have much detail. I don't think we're going to cover this. So it's Twitter. So it gives him a way of communicating directly with 16 million followers and also a way of shaping the media's agenda. We have a pretty big megaphone. We can put it in context. We can ask for more detail. But the idea that this is great debate, that we're just not going to cover what the future POTUS says, I don't think so. President-elect Donald Trump taking to Twitter to echo this promise. Companies are not going to leave the United States anymore without consequences. Not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Cheryl Cassoni from our sister network, Fox Business, here with Mr. Trump's new message to American business owners. Cheryl?
Good morning. Donald Trump took to Twitter again, this time aiming his commentary at U.S. companies that outsource operations overseas. In a series of tweets, the president-elect said, quote, any business that leaves our country for another country then thinks it will sell its products back into the U.S. without retribution or consequence is wrong. Please be forewarned prior to making a very expensive mistake. The United States is open for business. Uh, the United States is open for business is his last line, but he also went on to say uh, that he wants to take the corporate tax rate down from its current 35% level to 15%. Well, a major recall to tell you about Toyota recalling more than 744,000 Sienna minivans from model years 2001 through 2016 because of a door problem. The sliding doors on the Sienna may not close correctly, and there are reports of the door sometimes freezing. The worry is the door would dislodge while the vehicle is moving. So far, no injuries have been reported, and notices to all Sienna owners will go out next month. All dealers have been instructed to stop selling new Sienna on their lot. And finally, just in time for the holiday travel season to get into full swing, Forbes is rating the best and worst airlines for holiday travel. Based on on-time performance during previous holidays, as well as other factors like Wi-Fi access and loyalty programs, number one, Hawaiian Airlines. But the rest of the list does include Delta Airlines, Alaska Airlines, Virgin America, and United. That rounds up the top five. Tis the season for a lot of fun travel out there. Back to you. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things that I've really been struck by in the news conference of all the appointees this week is that many of them are, well, the political headline was Team of Gazillionaires. And it's true that many of the people that Donald Trump has tapped are either billionaires or multimillionaires. In other words, they're pretty rich. Um, let's look at a little bit of the media chatter on this subject. Billionaire investor Wilbur Ross tapped for Commerce Secretary. Todd Ricketts, whose billionaire family owns the Chicago Cubs, Deputy Commerce Secretary. Sensing a pattern here? The administration is starting to staff up with its top names. It's turning into quite a full employment program for the nation's billionaires. So the Washington Post has a whole piece on this on the front page. Their collective wealth in many ways defies Trump's populist campaign promises. So because they're successful businessmen and have made a lot of money, they're going to be anti-populist? Is that a fair assumption? Uh, it may prove not to be a fair assumption, but it's not a totally unreasonable uh, assumption on which to base a news story right now at this point in time, I don't think. I mean, uh, JFK, well, uh, FDR were pretty yeah, rich guys sure, who sure, certainly yeah. did a lot for the American middle class. Yeah, they were. But, you know, I mean, the, the, the JFK's or uh, FDR's uh, labor secretary was Frances Perkins. She wasn't a rich person. I mean, you know, this, uh, you know, all these cabinet people are rich in both administrations, uh, both parties. That is certainly true. Trump, Trump talked a very, very different game. That's fair. Obama's ambassador appointments were mostly donors. I didn't see the collective yeah, media. <laughs> and Obama had more than any past president. And President Obama's commerce secretary, Penny Pritzker, who comes from the Hyatt family, worth about two and a half billion dollars or something like that. So, is there an assumption? And by the way, if these people uh, carry out policies that do favor their wealthy friends and try to stick it to the middle class, then I think the press should hold them accountable. But they haven't taken office yet. So, is there an assumption when it's uh, Republicans, which Republicans, that it's a little different? Uh, of course, there always is a different um, presumption of incompetence given to Republicans. But I think also the American people, people elected a billionaire president. They elected someone who was a current business person. This idea that he was suddenly supposed to, you know, shake off all business ties to his own business, that he was never going to appoint someone who he knew through his business ties, uh, that's not what the American people said on Election Day. I think until he starts, as you said, yeah. actually taking actions in one direction or another, the media needs to take a deep breath and find a new way to cover him. You know, uh, the president-elect talked about seeing a report, it was actually on NBC Nightly News, about uh, people at the carrier air conditioner plant uh, saying they thought he had promised to save their jobs. But the great symbolism of what he did there, whether you think it was a good deal or not, the thousand jobs. Just to come back to that flag burning tweet, it actually happened after Trump saw a Fox News report about a college in Massachusetts where some students who were opposed to Trump's election had burned the flag. So it wasn't completely out of the blue. Uh, so just to wrap up here on his use of Twitter, I mean, sometimes he gets to set the agenda. Presidents tend to have a pretty good megaphone. That's right. Again, though, with that particular tweet, that has the precedent has been set by the courts on flag burning. And it so he's being provocative. Maybe yeah. he, has, he didn't say, I will propose on my first day in office. He said, I think they should go to jail if they burn the flag. A lot of people would agree. It could be that some of these tweets 
stop once he is the president. Kellyanne Conway was asked this morning if these tweets would continue once he's in office, and she said that's up to him and the Secret Service. Well, he can appoint the Secret Service head he wants. You believe that this was a mistake, right? Why? I don't, it was a mistake by which I mean I think it was a bad decision. I don't think that it was an accident. Um, I give the president-elect and his team a lot more credit than that. I believe that he knew exactly what he was doing and this was part of a larger strategy to push back against China. What I take issue with is not the phone call itself and the fact that he had communications with the leader of Taiwan. I take issue with the fact that he ended up acknowledging the country's national sovereignty by calling the leadership, their president, and referring to them as a nation. That's very dangerous when it comes to our, the U.S. relationship with China, which is, as we all know, going to be very central to world order in the 21st century. All right. So in terms of what it potentially shakes up, I mean, it could be that what Mr. Trump is trying to do is kind of open that dialogue with China, and they push back a little bit. Obviously, one of our biggest concerns is North Korea. And, you know, we haven't always gotten where we wanted to get with China on the issue of North Korea. So does this open the door and begin a dialogue that might lead to that? So what, what's happened here is that it, as much as I would like to see um, the president of the United States push back harder against China, I just don't believe this was the way to do it. Um, I think that the reality is we still need China in order to accomplish many of our objectives overseas. We need them, as you mentioned, to help hedge against North Korea's nuclear development and to hold on to the billions of dollars of U.S. debt that they currently own. Because if they were to sell that on, it would precipitate a huge financial crisis here at home. So the nuclear component here is one piece of a larger puzzle, if you that know, makes sense. So if I get you right in terms of your, your first response, there was discussion over the weekend, oh, you know, maybe, maybe Donald Trump doesn't even understand what our relationship is with, China, with Taiwan on this or with China on this, um, and he hasn't read, he's not listening to the briefings of the State Department. But what we're hearing this morning is that, that that's very far from the truth, that this was much more likely a calculated, discussed move with his sort of kitchen cabinet secretaries of state that he's been discussing things with. Oh, absolutely. I think that the criticism that this was a sort of gaffe and that this was a spontaneous call that happened and he just answered his cell phone or whatever phone he had is a little bit um, juvenile, to be frank. Um, I think that one of the things that President-elect Trump has been thinking about since he started this campaign two years ago is how he wants to reshape and reorder the United States bilateral relationship with China, how he wants our influence in the region to expand, how he wants to deal with the aftermath of President Obama's pivot to Asia. Um, yeah. So this is something that he's been thinking about carefully. I just disagree with his decision to acknowledge Taiwan's national sovereignty in this phone call and in his subsequent comments. You know, I, I think I, that that was premature. I,